Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here at the Newsroom Pub. Again, I'm Mary Ann Lasarski from Milwaukee PBS, president of the Press Club. Great to see all of you here today. And I'm happy to be here today with former Wisconsin Governor Tommy Thompson. Hey. He's the state's longest running serving governor, sorry, also served as U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services under President George W. Bush, and more recently as president of the Universities of Wisconsin System. Before we get started, of course, I want to thank our event sponsors. Our presenting sponsor is Spectrum News One. Our supporting sponsor is We Energies. I'd also like to thank our event partner, WISPolitics.com. WISPolitics.com partners with the Press Club for this luncheon as part of its ongoing event series in Milwaukee, sponsored by UW-Milwaukee, Wisconsin Academy of Global Education and Training, 1125 at Pabst, Medical College of Wisconsin, Commercial Association of Realtors, and Spectrum. And I'd also like to introduce our media panel for today, uh, Emily Fannin from CBS 58 News, Jeff Mayers from wispolitics.com, and Pete Zervakis from Spectrum News One. Welcome. And now, please welcome former Wisconsin Governor Tommy Thompson. Thank you very much, Marianne, and I asked Marianne to uh, uh, to start as soon as possible because uh, I got want to say a few things, and then I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, being interrogated by by Jeff Mayer and two two wonderful reporters. <laughs> Happy, Happy birthday, Jeff! <laughs> I um, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, first off, I'm uh, extremely happy. We've got our, all the corn and beans in the ground, a thousand acres of them, and so uh, the, we're happy uh, back on the farm. And uh, I'm excited to be here. I've been here several times, and I always look forward to this opportunity to converse with the press. I'm sad about the fact that we don't have better and more press coverage at the Capitol in the city halls. And I know it's because, you know, news has changed, social network has changed, and it's taken over, and the newspapers have decided that it's not economically feasible to put as many of you up in the Capitol. And I think it's a terrible mistake for our democracy. And even though a lot of you I did not particularly care for, well, you like me, you just didn't write good things about me. Uh, but uh, it was, uh, the type of thing that I thought government was was better to have the press, the free press there asking tough questions every single day. So I miss that. And I think uh, our government has not been as good when we retrenched and retracted and didn't have as much press coverage as uh, we used to have. Uh, I can remember back when we had uh, all kinds of press coverage coming down from Green Bay every day, John Wingard, how many people still remember John Wingard? Uh, Jeff and, and Jeff do, and uh, I do. Uh, great reporter, and uh, you didn't buffalo him, and he would write it as straight as it possibly can be. Uh, but that is not what the story's all about. That is part of the story. But the story is, is that one day I was reading the Milwaukee Journal. I was sitting in my governor's office on a Sunday morning, and I read at that particular time that uh, only 15% of the <clears throat> black students, male students, were going to graduate from high school. Uh, they had uh, dropped out or went another way, and only 15% of the black uh, male students that started MPS were going to graduate. And I decided, looking at uh, that newspaper article, that I had to do something about it. I'm the type of guy that sees a problem. I got I to gotta come up with a solution. May not be the correct one, but I'm going to attack that particular problem. And I looked at it, and I said, I got to do something about this. Because if we do not do this, the city of Milwaukee, the prison system, they're going to grow, and the city of Milwaukee is not going to get the talent that they need to grow. And so I came over here and I met with the, a lot of uh, black ministers, 
met with the, a lot of uh, families uh, throughout the city. And from that and those meetings, I still remember we, a meeting with Bishop Daniels. He, I think he had 25 uh, to 30 uh, black ministers out at his school. And we spent all afternoon talking about education in, in Milwaukee. And coming out of that meeting, it was decided that one of the biggest problems was, was busing students from the city of Milwaukee out to Wauwatosa, out to Brookfield, and so on. And the families didn't get a chance to interact with their students. And they said, why can't we send our students to a church school or to a private school down the street? And that became the clarion call for me to start school choice in charter schools in Wisconsin, which we were number one. And today, that movement has uh, gone to 38 states across the country on its way to 50. Why do I say that? Because today, MPS is still suffering. We have difficulties with MPS. You notice what is taking place. It's on everybody's mind. And I look at it and I say, you know, it's time to make some real changes. I cannot remember the political person. I think it was uh, 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 former mayor of uh, Chicago that said, never leave an emergency without coming up with some sort of solution. And we have an emergency situation that has been taking place in Milwaukee for many years, 30 to 40 years. And when I started as governor, there was a mayor by the name of John Norquist. How many of you remember Big John? And Big John and I had many discussions, even though we were absolutely different, diametrically opposed politically and philosophy. One thing that kept us together, a common bond, was improving the quality of education of MPS and the Milwaukee students. Because we both believed that the hope that those students needed was not being realized. They were not graduating. They were not getting the education necessary. And after that, and after I started school choice in charter schools in Wisconsin, it took off across the country. John Norquist was very much in favor of that. Even the Milwaukee Journal, which editorialized against me on it, came around and saw the opportunity for choice in Milwaukee. And then from there, John Norquist wanted to have the opportunity to run the school system. And I supported him. That's before a lot of you uh, were even involved in covering the news. And then uh, Tom Barrett came. And we were very close to having Tom Barrett take the position of maybe the mayor should be involved in helping to run the Milwaukee Public Schools. Uh, Tom. Uh, backed away a little bit from it, I believe. I'm not exactly sure. I don't want to speak out of, out of turn because uh, Tom has, uh, has did a good job and I don't want to criticize anybody. But I'm just saying that there were two mayors that particularly wanted the opportunity to do something about MPFs. I came up with a program, and I don't know how many of you even remember it, and I said what needs to be done in Milwaukee. The Milwaukee public school system needs to be divided into four equal school districts. Four equal school districts. Because it is too big, it's too unwieldy. And when you elect people in which the teachers union, and I'm not complaining about the teachers, because I think the teachers, Milwaukee teachers, do as a good job as much as they're capable of doing in regards to not capable, they're very capable people. But the fact is that the Milwaukee public school system is set up. It's too big. It's too bureaucratic. There's too much over, uh, too many ro roles of bureaucracy. It doesn't get down to the educational system. You also saw where the Association of Commerce came out against the referendum. And the referendum passed. But now the, but now the superintendent of schools has stepped down. And one of the problems was is not keeping the books up to date and keeping the keeping the financial budget in line. And we have this kind of problem. And what we're doing is we're failing. We're failing the students to go to Milwaukee Public Schools. We've been failing those students for 30 to 40 years. And now is the time to change. We do have an emergency, so let's do something about it. 
I'm advocating having a, a blue ribbon committee take a look at MPS from, from <clears throat> the beginning to the end and finding out what it is. I would also advocate very strongly of splitting up MPS into four equal school districts. And I would also advocate very strongly that your fine mayor, Cavalier Johnson, who I think is doing an outstanding job, to be able to come in and help put together that Blue Ribbon Commission, along with David Crawley, another young, great black leader in Milwaukee. Allow those two individuals that believe in Milwaukee and Milwaukee County, like I do and like you do, and believe that we have an opportunity now to put MPS on a new approach. And you don't need a long period of time. We know the problems. Let's come up with solutions. Let's bring in the Milwaukee business community. They have a huge stake here. Let's bring in the parents, because they have a huge stake. It's their sons and daughters that we're failing and not giving them the education they need to go out and be giving them the hope for a better future. Let's bring in some of the groups. Let's bring in the teachers' union. They're going to come in. Let's bring them in. Let's have them be involved in setting up a new type of school district in Milwaukee. Let's not point fingers. Let's get on with it. And let's be able to make the Milwaukee Public School, I think it still needs to be split up. Strongly have, believed it, put it in, and believe very much that it should be divided up into four school districts. You look at, you look at uh, <clears throat> Sun Prairie. Sun Prairie now is just split into two school districts, the east and the west, and they're both doing extremely well. Competition in Milwaukee school district would be very good. And I think that we should do that. And I think the mayor, the county exec, Association of Commerce, Gail Kiyinga, a former legislature, and you take into consideration what, is, what happened this past year. You had Mayor Johnson, County Exec Crowley, sitting down with Republican legislators and legislators on both sides. And they came together and developed a new state revenue package for shared revenue for the city and county of Milwaukee. And they got control of it. They did it together on a bipartisan basis. That's what I'm talking about. Let's use this leadership now. Let's use this problem area right now and develop the Milwaukee Public School District the best that it possibly can and give those children in Milwaukee Public Schools the hope, the chance that they all need and deserve. And I also take a look at higher education, which I came from. And as a lot of you know, I said five years ago, I said set up a blue ribbon task force for the university system because we got huge problems coming. A reduction of students. And I asked the governor to get involved. I asked the Board of Regents to do it. And nobody wanted to do it. And I kept advocating for it. And I still believe that's what's needed. You take a look at vocational schools and two-year campuses, which are, now, which are now failing because we don't have enough students. And yet, in the same communities, all over the state, we have a vocational school and a two-year campus. That's ridiculous when you don't have enough students to fill them. What you need to do is you need a community college system and put them together and allow students to have the hope to go to those schools and matriculate up through, out of MPS, give them the hope to go to a two-year campus, matriculate up and go to school and be able to get a college education, a vocational education, and that's through the community college system. And be able to save money, build the district so that you have the capacity and you have the students there to service them. Instead of closing them down without trying something, I think is a complete failure. And so those are my quick reactions. I know I spoke more than the five minutes that Marianne <laughs> gave me. But I wanted to tell you I am damn serious. When you got a problem, don't look around. Get at it, attack it, and do it. 
and set it up and do it just like you did on shared revenue. Let's do it for MPS. Let's do it for the University of Wisconsin system and the vocational system. Thank you very much. <laughs> Besides, I really believe it. I think you crossed off a lot of MPS questions we had on our list here as journalists. Uh, but to, to follow up on that, is it time for MPS to be taken over? And by who? Complete takeover. It, it needs to be changed. I think split up MPS into four equal districts like I advocated back when it should have been done then. It should have been, we should have done it when John Norquist and I were talking about it in the, early, in the late 80s and early 90s. And nobody wanted to do it. Everybody wanted to keep the status quo. Tom Barrett and I talked about having the, the mayor take over when he was here. And then a lot of opposition developed and backed away. Can't back away. Got to go. We got to save the school system for those young students, those young men and women who are coming out of there that need the hope instead of a failing school district. And that's why it needs to be split up or it needs to be taken over. It should not continue the way it is. Why don't you just advocate for a takeover period? Because it, you contemplated it, and like you said, uh, it didn't want to have, uh, you know, and now the problem has existed in your mind for 30 to 40 years. So why not just advocate for a straight takeover by the mayor and the county executive? I'm willing to do that, Jeff, but I think it should be studied first. I think, I don't want to just say that, I, don't, I haven't talked to the mayor, I haven't talked to the county exec. I don't know if they got the desire. I don't know if they want to do that. But I think they certainly have got the desire and passion for Milwaukee, and they're great young leaders that will want to do something about setting up a better system. So let's bring those two young men in along with other people and study it. You don't need a year to study it. Not three months and get it ready for the fall. Right, but like you said, the teachers union would have to be involved. And, uh, you know, and now the business community is against the teachers union. There's a divide there because of the whole referendum thing. So how are you going to get all those players involved to do a takeover or to really revamp the school district? Because the referendum created a divide. It created a divide? And what's wrong with that? When you got a divide, you got a problem, bring it back together again. There's nothing about a good fight. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. So, and there's been a good fight. Now it's time to put the pieces together. Now's the time to bring the uh, study committee a 90 day. Waiting. Turn your telephone off, Jeff. <laughs> Dean, you should have done that. <laughs> Now's the time to put a 90-day blue ribbon task force together and with the mayor and the county exec and bring all the diverse groups in. The smart thing to do is to bring, when you're fighting somebody, to bring them in the tent. Bring the business people, bring the teachers union in, bring the parents in and sit down and say, you know, we got a problem. If we go back to the same system, in five years we're going to have the same problem. Let's change the system now. Everybody's been advocating it. Let's get it done. Let's do it in 90 days and go take it to the legislature. The legislature would jump at the chance to do something. Well, not until they come back early next year. But what? Yeah, okay. But, okay, but was the referendum passed under false pretenses here? How can you say it passes under false pretenses? It's an election. Somebody won, somebody lost. And uh, that's, uh, that's what happened. I, I can't say it was under false pretense. I didn't put the budget together. I do know that uh, education needs money. I also know that they spend a lot of money on bureaucracy in Milwaukee. And now's the time to change that. Now's the time. Don't give up the opportunity. You've got a, you've got a problem, attack it. Don't, don't just talk about it. Just don't write about it. Let's bring it together and let's start solving the problem. That's, you know, that's been my mantra ever since I was governor, Jeff. I see a problem. I don't run from it. I run towards it. And that's, what, this is, that's why I'm so happy I'm here today, because you've got a problem here. I want to talk about it. I want to get to the front of it, and I want to say, let's bring in the best minds, and let's come up with some solutions. 
I'd even have you on the committee because I think you got some some pretty, some pretty good opinions sometimes. So that's that, that's what I need. I, I want the best minds that I come. I have to set a higher bar. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I want I want the best minds in that room, and I want to give. And the worst thing in the world is have a year. The worst thing in the world is to have a year study committee. Ninety days, get in, get the get the thing. Pass it, take it to the legislature, and adopt it. You'd be amazed how we could get started in the beginning of January next year with a whole new system. Yeah. Governor, I'm going to stay on this theme but switch topic, but you're talking about taking action, so I want to throw a couple hypotheticals at you. Um, first of all, Wisconsin Policy Forum says right now state debt is the lowest it's been in 25 years. Now, that being said, still $11 billion. If you were governor right now, would you take advantage of that, state's better credit rating, start bonding to fund things like road and infrastructure repairs? And then, second, second hypothetical. Of course I would. I'm a builder. Second hypothetical. Would you eliminate yeah, the state income all, tax? Put me along the 4 lane highway across the state of Wisconsin. It was Tommy Thompson. I'm a builder. There were two seasons when I was governor. Winter time and highway construction time. And I'd go back to that. You're damn right I would. Republicans have also, Senator Lemahue has been very strongly in favor of, he says, we need to eliminate the state income tax to stay competitive. If you were governor, would you do that? Why not? What's wrong with getting rid of the state income tax if you can do it? I don't know if you can do it, but if you can do it, what's wrong with it? Why not make Wisconsin better than Florida as far as attracting people to come here? We got better weather. You know, we got, you know, you take a look at those other states. We got Wisconsin. We are an island. We got all this fresh water, and everybody's going to want it. You know, so let's let's develop the values that we have in Wisconsin, and let's sell. Let's make Wisconsin a state that everybody wants to come to. Got to improve our education to do that. We got to improve Milwaukee, and we got to improve the university system. Yesterday, Attorney General Josh Call charged three individuals yes. in the Trump circle uh, in the fake elector scheme. Uh, do you think more individuals should be charged, including those 10 Wisconsin Republicans who signed that paperwork falsely stating that former President Donald Trump won? Why would I want to do that? <laughs> Why would I want to have anybody charged? I, 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 I mean, uh, if they break the law, fine, but I haven't seen anybody break the law yet. And if, if they find that... Would you have signed that paperwork if you were in that room as an elector? No. Well, explain. Huh? Why not? Well, because I, I believe in elections. I live and die by elections. I've won some and I've lost some. I like winning better. <laughs> yeah. You know, we have the former president also continuing to claim that question, I should say, uh, whether he's going to accept their election results. What do you think that does to the Republican base and also him continuing to spew falsehoods that he won Wisconsin? Well, I think, <laughs> I think the uh, uh, President, uh, President uh, Trump is, uh, has got a great opportunity to win. I mean, uh, uh, you talk about President Trump, I'll talk about President Biden. I think, uh, you know, there's, in my comparison, there's no question that uh, that our country is going the wrong way, and we need a change. And uh, President Trump uh, offers that change, so I will be supporting him. You are going to be supporting him? Yes. But I don't like to put Republicans in jail. If, that's, if you're asking that question, I certainly am not going to favor that. Okay, so the Republican Party has been taken over by Donald Trump, and the Republican Party that exists today is not anything like the Republican Party when you were governor and when you were running for president. So do you like the change in the Republican Party that's, that has occurred that is really about all one individual, not the grassroots? Uh, <laughs> I like... Uh I like my Republican Party a hell of a lot better than the progressive Democratic uh, left wing uh, that's taken over the Democrat Party. I think uh, when you come, you, ha you can't do the Republican Party in, in a vacuum. You've got to compare it to what the Democrats are. The Democrats are so far left that they're the ones, I think, that are ruining the country. The open borders, 
high inflation, the kind of turmoil we got in our cities, the crime, the education system, they're in charge, they're responsible. So you can, you can blame uh, Donald Trump for a lot of things, but once you blame Donald Trump, I'm going to bring, back, bring you back to reality that the Democrats are leading us in worse shape right now as a country than, than President Trump ever did. Okay, so you're a delegate to the National yes, Convention. Sir. You're in the Wisconsin delegation, and you're comfortable with uh, nominating Trump to be the presidential nominee despite everybody's misgivings, the verdict, uh, the charges against him in, in other jurisdictions. You're comfortable with that? I am comfortable with uh, Donald Trump being the candidate. Yes, I am. And I, once again, you bring up Trump, I'm going to bring up... Uh, up uh, the current president, and if anybody's got problems running this country, it's him. And I think the people are recognize the problems that the current president has. So you're about the same age as Biden. Is he too old to be president? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely not. Could Biden give a speech like that? Hell no. <laughs> Governor, you mentioned you think uh, the former president has a really good chance to win Wisconsin oh, again. Absolutely. I want to throw a quote at you from the Institute for Reforming Government and just get your response. This was late last year. They surveyed college-educated women in the WOW counties. And it says what they found in this survey was that the women in suburban Milwaukee are politically moderate and care most about solving problems. Trust in both major parties is low, but when they're forced to choose... The women believe Democrats will do a better job in office than Republicans. How does your party fix that issue before November? Uh, the same way uh, as uh, always have, you have, to, uh, you have to address the issues, and you have to go out and campaign, and you have to talk about the issues, and you have to come up with answers that uh, individuals will support and vote for. And uh, I think the uh, Republican Party has uh, better answers than the Democrats on all the major subjects. The major subjects that are out there is the border, <clears throat> high inflation, taxation, education, cost of living. All of those, the Republicans have much better solutions and answers than the Democrats. So you're going to ask me, Republicans, I'm going to put it right back at you. Compared to the Democrats, we're in better position. And the Democrats got more problems in Wisconsin than the Republicans do. Republicans, if you look at the polls, Donald Trump is leading in all the polls. That would indicate to me that the people are saying, I'm going to follow in that leadership much more so than what uh, uh, Donald, uh, but, uh, President Biden is uh, taking us. One issue you left off was the abortion issue. I mean, that has been repeatedly emphasized since Roe v. Wade was overturned. Yeah. Do you think your party has the better answer on that issue? And if so, I what think should the, the message be? The Republican Party's got to refine their, 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 uh, their uh, position on abortion. You gotta, if you're going to talk about abortion, you've got to talk about children. You gotta, Republican Party has got to come up with an absolute uh, better answer to abortion. They've got to come up with... What are you going to do with the children? How are you going to take care of the children? How they're going to have uh, uh, how they're going to have healthy births? How they're going to be taking care in child care? How they're going to be taking care in daycare? This is where Republicans got to come up with answers. Now, I would be out there right on. I'd say <clears throat> I think there should be a statewide referendum on it and have the people in the state of Wisconsin set the parameters. Let let both parties argue what it is and let the people decide. And then set up whatever that time limit is. Is it 12 weeks, 15, 20, whatever it is, that's going to become the law in the state of Wisconsin. And have everybody get behind it. And then develop programs. You know, if you're not going to have it, you're going to have to have babies. You're going to, be, you're going to have babies. You're going to have to take care of them. And you've got to have solutions. You've got to have answers for them. Now, I would do that if I was a candidate. If I was running for president, I'd have all those answers laid out right now. 
And uh, I think that's what you have to do if you're going to be a Republican and run as a Republican. If you want to win, you got to address, just like MPS. Right now, you got a problem. Let's address it. Let's get on and let's address the problem and find out solutions. 90 days. Abortion, Republicans sit down, find some answers, find some solutions, and put it out there. That's what needs to be done. We're 40 days uh, to the RNC, and there's also right. been a lot of talk about the former president being sentenced just four days before that. What type of impact do you think that could have on the convention itself, and do you think it will sway the very important voters that we like to call independent voters, and it's finding them is also very difficult? There's no question. You know, one thing you're going to find for me is complete honesty. And there's no question in my mind that's going to have some influence. No question. It's bound to. When you're, when you're that close, you know, it's going to have an impact. A good impact or a bad impact for Republicans? I think it, it's going to have it, someone, well, I don't think it's going to affect the Republicans much. I think it's going to affect the presidential candidate somewhat. But I think, uh, I think uh, Donald Trump has got answers for it. And I think, I think the appellate courts are going to overrule the... Uh, the court decision, and I think he's going to be found uh, innocent. So I, I don't think in the in the end of it, but you ask me right now, I think it's going to have somewhat of an impact. It's got to. Else the Democrats wouldn't want to, wouldn't want to push through it. And if he's sentenced to, to jail, I hope he isn't. I don't know what this is going to happen. It's got to have some kind of an impact. Another thing that Republicans are pushing this election cycle is voting early and the possibility that absentee they ballot. Done that a long time ago. Absentee ballot drop they boxes. To me 20 years ago, and they should have been doing that right, right along. Do you think there's enough being done to convince Republicans to do that? Meanwhile, we, the former president, continues to criticize absentee voting, and I'm not making claims I, that are not true me, about I, it. I think you should be out there if you want to. If you want to vote early, vote early. Don't vote often, but, <laughs> but vote early. Okay. <laughs> I've heard all these jokes before. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to switch gears. Former HHS secretary, when you were at the WIS Politics uh, lunch, and I asked you about uh, uh, the CDC and the next pandemic, and you did not have confidence in the, in the, in the way things were going and how we had come out of COVID and whether we were ready for the next pandemic. So are we ready for the bird flu pandemic? I, I mean, is the country ready for another pandemic that's going to be different than the one we just went through? And what would you do to make it ready? I don't think we're ready because there's too much suspicion. There's too much uh, hatred. Uh, there's just way too much uh, confusion out there. How did the, how did the uh, COVID start? Was it uh, by an animal, a bird, or was it the Wuhan lab? That's still to be decided. I think it looks like it could very well have been from the Wuhan lab, but I, have, I don't have you know, uh, complete uh, all the evidence to make that determination. But when you have that kind of suspicion, you're not going to be prepared, Jeff. You've got to, in order to deal with a catastrophe or an epidemic like COVID, you've got to have a, a strong majority of the people supporting the science. And if the science has been proven incorrectly, and in some cases it has since then, people become suspicious, very suspicious. And now uh, there's as much evidence that the mask didn't do any help at all. Uh, and so if you would say, we're going to come back now and have Jeff Mayers wear a mask, pretty doubtful you're going to wear a mask. Maybe you will, but I won't. Uh, but, uh, but that's the problem. It's the suspicion out there and the confusion out there as to whether or not we will be prepared for another epidemic. Okay, well, isn't that up to the leaders? I mean, you know, Trump undermined, you know, the 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 bureaucracy, the the health bureaucracy at the time. Did he yeah, not? Thank you very much. 
You're great. Oh, Marianne, that's right. <laughs> right in the middle of my big question, Marianne. Is a, <laughs> just kidding. Okay. No, but I mean, I mean, so did you like the way Trump was undermining the healthcare bureaucracy at the time? Because that wasn't helping with uh, with trust, was it? <laughs> well, I go back. <laughs> I go back to uh, the New York mayor and governor Cuomo, who was who was lying about the nursing home. So you you say it was Trump. Uh, I take a look at one of the leading Democrats at that particular time, actually cooking the books. And that probably did much more than what, what Trump did. Trump thought he, what he was doing was correct. I think, uh, I think where, where, uh, I would have been, where I would have done differently is I would have had the scientists out there uh, making the reports on a daily basis instead of uh, myself. And I think uh, when an <coughs> elected official, a politician, no matter who or he or she is, is out making scientific assertions and trying to get people to follow it, it's, it's difficult. And it leads to questions and political banter. And so my, uh, my strong suggestion in the future is to have the scientists get out and if they're gonna have daily, and I don't think you need daily reports, weekly reports is, is plenty. Uh, and get it out to the public in as unbiased and as accurate with scientific evidence backing it up, and then you're going to get people to start believing you. And that's what we need to do in the future. Governor, I know we've hit the RNC pretty heavy already, but with the convention being so close, I had one more RNC question. Sure. I mean, you've campaigned all around this state so many times. I think probably bipartisan committee would agree that you know the people of Wisconsin as well as anyone. Right. Do you think the RNC will actually change anyone's mind, or do you think it's more a question of either getting people to vote for former President Trump or that they will just stay at home? I mean, do you think there's actually any persuadable voters left in yep. this matchup given that we just had this four years ago? Absolutely. I mean, not many, but absolutely. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer of retail politics. And I believe so strongly in getting out and talking to people. And as all of you know, I have a lot of Democrats supporting me or did have, a lot of independence. And that's because I went wherever I knew there were voters. And I thought I could convince them or talk to them. And if they like you, they'll vote for you. And if you meet them, the more likely will vote for you. So the more hands you shake, the more telephone calls you make, the more <coughs> appearances you have in front of them, the better chance you have of being able to convince those individuals to, uh, to support you and vote for you. Now, the RNC being here in Milwaukee, there's going to be thousands of Republicans walking up and down the streets of Milwaukee. Individuals that have probably never voted for a Republican are going to actually see a living, breathing, live Republican. <laughs> And they're going to be in their stores and in their bars and in their restaurants, and they're going to be talking to people. They say, you guys are not bad. You're pretty friendly. You're pretty nice. <laughs> so yes, they're going to convince people from Milwaukee to vote for Republicans because the convention's here. But that's true all over. And that's why I'm very happy the Republican convention is coming to Milwaukee. I think Milwaukee's a great city. It's a beautiful city. And the whole country is going to witness the beauty of this city and its people and how friendly they are. And go to some of the German restaurants. They're going to say, wow, that food is great. And the beer isn't bad either. And so I think it's, you know, I think it's the retail politics at its finest. It's going to take place here. And yes, they will convince people. And yes, I think Trump is going to win. 
But I also think, I don't, I don't think that uh, Biden's going to be the candidate, but I never, I never believed that. Switching gears here to uh, higher education, you know, it was just last month we saw a lot of protests on college campuses right. at the UW system uh, against the war in Gaza. Uh, do you think university leaders who reached a deal with protesters made the right call in doing so? And just general reactions to that possibly happening again? No, I, I, I don't think, I don't think you should allow students to break the university rules. I think you set up the rules, you set up laws, and they're there for, for a reason. They've been passed. The rules say no camping on Memorial Library. I don't think they should have been allowed to camp. I think people should have said no. You, you're a student, you're in violation. If you're not a student, you shouldn't be there in the first place. I think you have rules and laws. If you break the law, you have to pay the consequences. And uh, I just happen to believe that. Sticking on UW system, there's also been this big fight with Republicans, specifically Assembly Speaker Robin Voss, uh, looking yeah. to eliminate diversity, equity, and inclusion across yeah. college campuses. Your thoughts on that issue, uh, and do you think that Republicans should continue to try to attack DEI and root it out? I don't know. I don't know. Or is he going too far? No, no. I don't. I don't know if you should attack it, <laughs> but but show me where you know DEI was set up uh, to uh, increase the number of uh, of minority students graduating. <laughs> you prove. You show me. Where that's happened, the number of people that they put out there, the number of money that goes into it, and the accomplishments are not very good. We're getting more minority students to graduate on our campuses. So I think that I think, you know, instead of criticizing and tearing down, find out what the problem is and find out how to fix it. I mean, you, you put a lot of people there to, to accomplish something, and I don't think the record is good enough to brag about. So you believe DEI should stay at the university level? Well, I think DEI has got a place at the university, yes, but I think it needs to be, yeah, I think the requirements should be placed there, and uh, you should have a qualification, just like I believe MPS. MPS should be changed because I don't think it's meeting the needs of the students. And I th don't think DEI, I think DEI has given a lot of jobs to a lot of people, but I haven't seen where the success of increasing minority students graduating is in evidence. And that's where I, I differ with it. Not, not whether or not DEI in and of itself as a concept is okay, but let's, let's set up, set the program up to do and accomplish what it was set up to do. Get more minority students through college and graduate. That's where I differ. I want to see minority students graduate, have the hope from MPS and mat matriculate through the university system and get their degree. That's what I want. Okay, well you were UW system president and the, as you say, the numbers didn't budge. So what is the solution to get Basically, we have a student. We don't have enough students coming to UW system schools because, you know, the uh, the okay. demographic bubble isn't there, right? So, how do you encourage people? You know, and college degrees have been devalued in many people's minds. So, do, sh should we offer free college education? Would that help get more minority students? Here's what. It, no, I, I'm not. I, I, I'm not big on just giving away things because I I was never given anything. I had a, I, I no, but if if if, if, if cost no, is a barrier, no, no, if cost is a barrier, let, why not? No, let me let me tell you what the problem is. Okay. You got you got all these people. I don't know how many is it. Two hundred forty in an office up in Madison. Why don't you take half of them and put them in high schools across the state? Why don't you take those people out of Madison, out of their ivory tower, and put them in a classroom in Milwaukee public schools and counsel the students as to what what grades they have to have to get into college, what courses they have to have, 
and actually do the job of encouraging young minority students to go on to college. That's what needs to be done. And you will have more minority students if, in fact, you're going into school and meet with them, talk to them, educate them, and give them the opportunity to get a good education. That's what, that's what need, DEI needs to do. They need to do the hard work of going in and meeting the minority students in the schoolhouse, in the schoolroom, classroom. Governor's story out of Madison that caught my eye last week. Um, the governor and the WEDC launched the Wisconsin Investment Fund. This is hundred million, the initial fund that goes to startups all around the state. Returns obviously then go back into the fund, fund more startups around the state. Given how risky venture capital is, I mean the normal tail, one let's say, is 10, one out of 10. One out of 10 small businesses. Is this places. too risky for the state to be involved in or is this a positive way for state money to be used to stimulate the economy? Well, I think it's more federal money than state money. Uh, and I'm a big believer in getting more federal money into Wisconsin. I don't think we get enough. Um, never have. Um, I think that uh, I'm not big on it. Uh, I think venture capital, uh, I think there are a lot, of, a lot of individuals out there that have venture capital firms that can do the job. I'm not sure government has to fund venture capital. and. Uh, so I'm, I'm not a big fan of government putting money into venture capital funds. I think it uh, should be done by the private sector much more so. But everybody's doing it, and so Wisconsin is doing what other states are doing in regards to that. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> if you're able to show uh, that the money that you've invested is really uh, return, uh, you have a return on your investment, then I guess I can be convinced. But overall, I personally dislike government uh, getting involved in trying to support private business. Even though I did it when I was governor, and even th and even though even though I did it, it, it did everything I possibly could to bring business in because I believed in bringing business into Wisconsin. If that's possible, and you can show that it's done, fine. Similar I concept. Big on it. Similar concept around the country. Our friends to the south are arguing about this right now. Is kind of what we saw with Pfizer Forum, public private partnerships for sports arenas, different venues like that. Do you think those are appropriate? Um, I think they're more appropriate, yes. I, you know, we got, we got the Milwaukee uh, Brewer Stadium. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't, have had, wouldn't have had the Milwaukee Brewer Stadium if, uh, if I wouldn't have taken the leadership on that and, and got it here. Uh, if the state would not have been involved and uh, uh, we wouldn't have had the, and they're and they're they're in first place too. Their their average is 600, so uh, it shows that uh, it was the right decision. <laughs> I, go, I go I go back to the proof and the evidence and the and and uh, and and uh, they're in first place and they're doing well. I, I'm a little I'm somewhat concerned about the stability of their pitching core going the full year, but uh, but. Uh, yeah, I think I think that was uh, the right use. I think. Mm -hmm. I'm going to end on the topic of prisons, which is something you worked on quite a bit during your administration here in Wisconsin. There's been a lot of issues, uh, no doubt, here in Wisconsin. There's actually a press conference going on right now about Wapan prisons. They were about to have a press uh, conference about ongoing death investigations. Now I don't know the details of that, but a lot of the issues that are happening are due to staffing issues in a lot of the facilities. You know, if you were governor, what do you think could be help solve that problem? And you know, these are issues that have been going on for years. How do you get to a point where you can incentivize people to want to work in our prisons when there's so many issues? <laughs> Um, but I happen to believe very strongly that Wisconsin should lead the way and turn a prison into a college. I would love, I tried to do it, and I had the money set aside when I was president of the university, uh, but as soon as I fell, uh, left, it uh, went by the wayside. I think, I think if you took my idea, turn a prison into a university, and had the vocational schools and the universities team up and put classes in prison. And first, the prisoners would have to apply for it. 
my idea. They have to apply for it and get chosen. And you can't have you can't have any infractions to the penalties. And if you do, you're not going to be able to stay in the classroom. You're going to find once you put a complete reduction on problems in the prison because they want to stay there. Number two, you bring in the private sector to set up, help set up the courses with the universities and vocational schools. What sort of jobs do you need? Number three, have the businesses sit down with the professors and put the courses in and also be required to hire them once they get through their classes. Four, act just like a classroom. They have to pass their courses, they matriculate through the system, and they, and they get, graduate, and then, the, and then the company hires them. And for every year that they've completed successfully, they get a reduction in their sentence. You will quiet the kind of problems prisoners have, and wardens will be protected because they will have a, a safer environment. So you're going to help the student, you're going to help the wardens, you're going to help the guards, because the prisoners, prisoner, prisons are going to be safer. And all of this together is going to help overall get young men and women out of prison with an education and a job when they get out. What could be wrong with that? Sounds like somebody should be a lot of money Why? Republicans are reluctant to. No, why would you need more money? It's a good question. But wouldn't you need money to invest in more programs to have in our prisons to keep them up to date? We have the three state prison that's probably the vocational teachers are being paid. They bring in. You're going to have to have some travel money and so on and so forth. But you're going to find a lot of professors with vocational school that say, "I want to do that. I would like to help improve a young man or a young woman and give them a chance to have it." I'm honored you're stupid. You know, I'm listening to you talk about so many different issues and, and proposed problems. So, two part question Would you ever run for governor again? And if, and <laughs> in two years? <laughs> what would it take to convince you to jump in? Oh, well, uh, I'd have to figure out if I want to get a divorce or not. <laughs> <laughs> Question number one. If you're not jumping in and it was up to you to say, I think this person should be the face of the party and run for governor of Wisconsin, was the first name that comes to mind? Oh. <laughs> Tommy Thompson. <laughs> Anybody else? Now, so if you can stand up and identify yourself, uh, raise your hand first, identify yourself and ask your question as briefly as possible. Thanks. Uh, Governor Thompson, Mark Hearn, uh, right over there is your signature on the wall. In 1987. Mm -hmm. Since then, uh, what would the Tommy Thompson from 1987 think of the current Tommy Thompson? Would he be thinking that he'd end up right where you are? <laughs> Looking back. No, I would, no, I, I would never have uh, never thought in 1987 I would have the successes that I've had. I have, I've been extremely lucky. And people who stayed at that absolutely great. Uh, I, uh, your father, the current family was some of my strongest supporters when I started out. Uh, your uh, uncle Charles, uh, current, I would remember having coffee with my family's better life. So you're crazy. <laughs> but I would support you. And uh, they always have. So, I got a great uh, love of affair with the current family, and you're uh, part of that heritage. But no, I, I've been extremely lucky. Who, who can it say that somebody that had to work himself through college 
tending farm, and getting in fights every every uh, every weekend, end up being elected governor, and then get appointed to be one of the largest department of health and human services, where I set up some programs like Part D, that was mine, uh, it was my idea, and Bush didn't, uh, Bush asked me to do it for him, and then you have the opportunity to be the president of the University of Wisconsin. Uh, you know, it's pretty amazing having that one. It's, uh, and I thank the people of the state for giving me that opportunity. Thanks for the question. Carolyn Crosby from the press club. Carolyn, how are you? As great as ever. Thank you. You're Back to NPS, you describe the situation and what you think should happen, get the people in a room, fighting, not fighting, whatever, and work it out. And it sounds like you might want to be the person in that room leading the conversation. Is that something you want to do? Well, I, I don't think I'm the right person. I, I'm too opinionated uh, for it, I, uh, and I am not uh, part of, uh, of the establishment in Milwaukee. I think this, this, is a, this is a Milwaukee problem, and the mayor and the county executive are two outstanding young people, young leaders that have all the faith in the world, and I think they should be the ones that are there, not, uh, not somebody from Elroy, Wisconsin, or from Elroy. I, I think, uh, I, I just don't think so. I, you know, I, I'll, be, I'll give you my idea. I would love, I would love to testify and tell you the history of, of that, uh, of, of uh, my experience with NPS and why it needs to be changed. But I don't think I'm the one that should be in that room and make that decision. That should be people in the walk to make that decision, not me. Excuse me if I don't stand, I have a little problem. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, Wayne Young was uh, former president of Bristol. The uh, question is, is, are there lessons to be learned from Chicago's attempts at reform? They did some of the things that you've suggested in the past, uh, and some of the stars worked, and some have not. They've gone to elections now. And I'm just wondering if there's lessons to be learned, or do you think there are lessons to be learned? Absolutely. That's the beauty of it. Let's take, the, let's take what's working. Let's look across this country, what's working in urban education, and build on it, and take the positive and make that happen. And uh, Chicago, uh, what was his name? Paul Vazala was the head of that. He ran for mayor. Paul has some great ideas. Not all of them were, were successful, but he has some great ideas. We should build on that. We should take those ideas up here to Milwaukee and build on them. Hi, Governor Joe Shelfa. Um, you mentioned just now working with Governor Norquist on school choice. Uh, I, I, I don't think he ever got elected governor. Why did you Sorry, uh, Mayor Norquist uh, on school choice. Mayor Norquist on um, uh, on uh, Miller Park, and it seemed like you were someone who really worked across the aisle to hit problems and attack them and find solutions. That doesn't seem to be happening anymore, with the, especially on the federal level. How do we get back? To actually working together to work for the people and get problems solved. I'll tell you how it should be done. Uh, and it's not working at the state level. What you, what you need to do, and I tell the candidates this, I said, run as a Republican. Run as a Democrat. But once you get elected, join the W party the Wisconsin party, the winning party, and come together and solve problems. When I was governor, I used to invite the Republican leadership in at 9.30 in the morning. I had to buy donuts, because they wouldn't buy them. I had to buy them. <laughs> then I'd 
10.30, 11 o'clock, I'm by the Democrats in leadership. So you just how far the Republicans go, how far I can go, how far can you go? Now, one thirty, I bring them all back together. And say, this is what Republicans want, this is what the, I want, this is what the Democrats want. Why can't we come together? It's that that big of a difference. I said, you can fight me all you want. And you think you're going to beat me in the next election? You're not. So let's forget about the election, let's forget about that, and let's solve the problems. Here's the problem. You give me your best answers. And it's amazing if you don't care who gets the credit, how much you can accomplish. It's amazing if you're bringing people together and say, you know, let's work together, let's find a solution. People love to talk. People love to be able to come up with ideas and solutions. Give them the opportunity. Don't, don't fire a, a press release about them and tell them how terrible they are. Forget about that. Do that in the election. But once you get elected, start being part of the winning combination. And, for, and you know, I used to. When I was running, I always had the agenda. I always told the people of my district, in the state when I was going to do. People don't do that anymore. People rather fight. I want to accomplish something. I want to solve a problem. I want to run at it. I want to get something done. <laughs> Nowadays, politicians, people who run for public office, only want to win plus one vote. Jim Clauser and I wanted all the votes. We always complain we never get enough food. We always look and why couldn't we have done more? My, my election against uh, <coughs> Chuck Wallach, I want every county in the state except Shawna County. I lost that by 22 votes. If I knew it was that close, I would have spent the last day up there. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you got to do. You got to reach out to the people and you got to come up with an agenda and you want to be able, if you run for these offices, why run for it? Just to run. Run to solve problems for Wisconsin. That's the mantra. That's what's got to be done, and people don't do that anymore. Next question. Well, it's for an easy audience. Yeah, no other questions? Last chance. Yeah. I'll ask. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy, what's going to come out? Sue Black. Um, yeah, Sue Black, yeah. Um, I just want to say hi to everybody, and I'm so um, motivated watching you speak, and I just want to make a comment, no real question. I just miss your leadership so much. Thank you. All right, that will wrap this up. Thank you again to our journalists. Thank you to former Governor Tommy Thompson. Just a, just a few quick things. Uh, thanks again to our event sponsors and to the Newsroom Pub and Safe House for being the hosting sponsor of this event. Um, if you're not a member of the Press Club and you'd like to be, uh, please see Joette uh, at the back of the room or go to MilwaukeePressClub.org and it's all spelled out on our website. Um, we'd love to have uh, you as a member. There are different levels, so uh, take a look. Uh, our next Newsmaker Luncheon is Monday, June 24th with uh, Visit Milwaukee's President and CEO, Peggy Williams-Smith. So that should be another great one. And again, I want to thank uh, former Governor Tommy Thompson, and I know you're a big fan of the media and the press, and I want to thank you for that. And Again, these are collector's items, so if you want to get one, 20 bucks, uh, you don't have to pay. <laughs> Again, if you, if you care about the future uh, and future journalists, uh, proceeds from those hats do go uh, towards our endowment, which helps students uh, and future journalists. So just saying, uh, if you really care about the future, you might want to think about buying a hat. Thank you. Enjoy the afternoon.